on World News Tonight. COVID chaos. Europe faces the brunt of fresh waves of infection as death predictions skyrocket. Health crisis. The world suffers from a lack of nutrition as populations eat too little or too much. Taliban takeover. Democracy stifled as citizens forced into censorship and submission. Season's greetings. Athens kicks off the Christmas spirit with dazzling displays. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with the updates on the COVID pandemic. The World Health Organization is warning the COVID-19 death toll in Europe could top 2.2 million by next spring, saying 700,000 more people could die on the continent over the winter. The UN agency's stark warning comes as many European countries are grappling with skyrocketing infections. As many European countries battle skyrocketing COVID-19 cases, the WHO warns the continent could see 700,000 more COVID-19-related deaths by March 2022, in addition to the 1.5 million that have already died. It also expects high or extreme stress in intensive care units in most European countries between now and early March. As Europe grappled with the surge, Austria returned to lockdown this week, while Germany and the Netherlands are poised to announce new restrictions. With daily new cases hovering around 50,000 for the past several days, Germany even logged more than 63,000 new cases on Saturday alone. The UK reported over 40,000 new cases on Sunday, taking the seven-day total to over 287,000, a 9.4% rise over the previous week. France recorded more than 30,000 new infections on Tuesday for the first time since August. Europe's return to the pandemic's epicenter has been largely blamed on the sluggish vaccine uptake in some nations, the colder weather, and the easing of restrictions. To this end, EU ministers met Tuesday to discuss the deployment of booster shots. The pandemic developments in the European Union worldwide are still dramatic. One thing is clear, vaccination saves lives. But the vaccination quota in too many member states of the European Union, unfortunately also in Germany, is too low. So now is the time to finally talk about it. The BBC says there are plenty of reasons to believe Britain will escape the worst of what's hitting mainland Europe, citing several reasons, including its swift vaccination rollout, high booster inoculation rate, and the timing of its easing of restrictions. The BBC also said it was better to have the virus rebound or the so-called exit wave in the summer. It adds this enabled the country to mitigate the spread thanks to the warmer weather that prompted people to spend more time outdoors and to avoid the winter crunch when pressure on the UK's health system increases across the board. The New Zealand government said it will keep its border closed to most international travellers for a further five months, only reopening at the end of April next year. New Zealand announced plans on Wednesday to reopen its borders to foreign travellers from the end of April next year. The country has had tight border controls in place since COVID-19 hit in March 2020, but those restrictions will now slowly be eased. From January next year, fully vaccinated New Zealanders and residence visa holders in Australia can travel to the country. New Zealanders from most other countries will be allowed in from February. Those arriving have to be fully vaccinated but will no longer be required to stay at state quarantine facilities. Instead, other measures will be put in place, including self-isolation and a negative pre-departure test. The government's tight border restrictions have helped New Zealand limit the spread of the disease, kept its death toll down and allowed the economy to recover faster than others. But an outbreak of the highly contagious Delta variant earlier this year forced the government to change track. The main focus has now been placed on vaccinating the population with the city of Auckland gradually opening up as inoculation rates climb. The situation remains very difficult in Guadeloupe, where unrest erupted over COVID-19 curbs imposed by Paris. Despite Prime Minister Jean Castex's call for calm in France's overseas territory, said the French Interior Minister. In the streets of Pointe-à-Pitre, security forces are deployed en masse. Even a helicopter hovers over the city. Special police personnel were sent in from the French mainland in a bid to restore order and enforce the curfew in Guadeloupe. 
This after the island was rocked by anti-vaccine protests that descended into riots last week. On Sunday, barricades were still set up in several cities. Here in Monalo, police are seen using tear gas to push away protesters. Meanwhile, in Le Gossier, these local council offices were vandalized and ransacked. While mainland France has seen similar protests, demonstrators in Guadeloupe are also angry over deep-rooted economic, social and racial inequality. Young people say they're struggling to get by. One out of three young people in Guadeloupe is unemployed, and more than a third of the population lives with less than 1,010 euros per month. The island's economy is largely dependent on tourism and agriculture, meaning a devastating financial impact from the pandemic. A new global assessment found that 48% of the population currently eats either too little or too much, resulting in harmful impacts for people and the planet. Nearly half of the world's population is suffering from poor nutrition, meaning they're eating too much or not enough. According to the Global Nutrition Report, which survey and analyzed the latest data on nutrition and related health issues annually, 48% of the global population are currently overweight, obese or underweight. The report added that at current rates, the world will fail to meet eight out of nine nutrition targets set by the World Health Organization for 2025. Some of the missed targets include reducing child wasting, referring to when children are too thin for their height, and child stunting, which indicate that children are too short for their age. The report estimates that nearly 150 million children under five years of age are stunted, while more than 45 million are wasted, and nearly 40 million are overweight. It also found that more than 40 percent of adults are now overweight or obese. Experts say people's diets have not improved over the last decade and are now a major threat to people's health and to the planet. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. The Biden administration is releasing millions of barrels from the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the largest release ever, in hopes of driving down fuel prices. The U United States is coordinating a global response to rising prices, hoping to force OPEC to meet the demand. The United States on Tuesday announced it would take the rare move of releasing oil from what's called the Strategic Petroleum Reserve part of a coordinated effort with the world's great industrial powers to drive down soaring energy prices. The White House said it will release 50 million barrels of oil in an agreement with China, India, South Korea, Japan and Britain. Climbing energy prices are contributing to overall inflationary pressures that are hammering U.S. President Joe Biden's public approval ratings. The announced release of strategic reserves comes after a group of major oil exporters known as OPEC Plus rebuffed Biden's repeated calls to pump more crude into global markets. The OPEC Plus states have shown no signs of a change of heart ahead of their December 2nd meeting. The UAE's energy minister said Tuesday he does not see the logic of ramping up oil production at this time. U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer welcomed the U.S. announcement, saying it offers, in his words, temporary relief for high gas prices. But he called for a long-term solution to eliminate dependence on fossil fuels and create a, quote, robust green energy economy. But analysts said the price impact stemming from the release of reserves will likely be short-lived after years of declining investments and a strong global recovery from the health crisis. It certainly was short-lived on Tuesday. Crude futures initially fell after the announcement, but rebounded strongly. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was briefly left lost for words when he appeared to lose his place in notes during a speech before regaling business leaders with an anecdote about his recent visit to a Peppa Pig theme park. Searching through his notes, Johnson sighed repeatedly muttering, forgive me, as he briefly interrupted his speech on the consideration of British industry in Port of Tyne in Northern England. He imitated car engine noises and compared his plan for green economy to the Ten Commandments. In what could be a potential blow for the Conservative Party, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is being blasted by senior business and political leaders for his speech at the Confederation of British Industry. 
In a lengthy tangent, the PM also extensively praised children's cartoon Peppa Pig. Yesterday I went, uh, as, as we all must, uh, uh, to, to Peppa Pig World. I don't know if you've been to Peppa Pig World. Who's been to Pans? I've been to been to Peppa Pig World. In fact, I was a bit hazy what I would find at Peppa Pig World, uh, but I loved it. And Peppa Pig World is, is very much my kind of place. The address was billed as a chance for Johnson to unveil proper policy as part of his 4.8 billion levelling up plan. Forgive me. But instead, he shuffled his papers in an awkward 21 second silence. Uh, with fantastic uh, broadband. Uh, Uh. Business leaders and opposition politicians have heavily criticized the Tory leader. The Prime Minister's shambolic speech today not only shows how unseriously he takes British business, but also how his government lacks any plan for growth or to propel our enterprising nations forward. Businesses are crying out for clarity. Instead, all they got was Boris Johnson rambling on about Peppa Pig. Nervousness among Tory MPs is said to have intensified, with sources telling British Media Guardian and the BBC that they are concerned. Post-speech, however, when asked by a reporter, the PM defended his performance, saying he thought the speech went over well. Human rights groups and Western lawmakers are warning that Interpol's powerful network of global police officers could end up under the sway of authoritarian governments as the World Police Agency meets in Istanbul this week to elect new leadership. Representatives of countries like China and the UAE are bidding for the top posts in France-based policing body when its General Assembly convenes in Turkey. The next 48 hours could be decisive for the future of Interpol. Police chiefs from around the world are gathering at the organization's annual meeting in Istanbul. Interpol has 194 member countries, all of them vying for influence. The Global Police Agency coordinates policing between countries, hunting down drug traffickers, people smugglers, war criminals and terror suspects. But the body's divisive leadership election is exposing Interpol's bitter fault lines. Critics say repressive regimes are using Interpol as a vehicle to hunt down political dissidents. One of the candidates for president, Major General Ahmed Nasser al-Raisi, is accused of being involved in torture and arbitrary detentions in the United Arab Emirates. Criminal complaints have been filed against him in five countries, including in France, where Interpol is based. Matthew Hedges was imprisoned in the UAE for nearly seven months on spying charges. He told his detention was akin to torture. China is also pushing its own candidate for a seat on the body's executive committee. Rights groups say Hu Binchen's election could put thousands of Chinese political dissidents abroad at risk. The Taliban administration released a set of restrictions on Afghan media, including banning television dramas that include female actors and ordering women news presenters to wear Islamic hijab. It has been 100 days since the Taliban toppled Afghanistan's Western-backed government and swept to power. And since then, Taliban officials have sought to publicly assure women and the international community that women's rights will be protected, despite widespread skepticism. But on Tuesday, November 23rd, the administration released a set of restrictions on Afghan media, with some edicts targeted specifically at women. The Ministry of Vice and Virtue announced nine rules. Rules largely centered on banning any media that contravenes Islamic or Afghan values, including banning television dramas that included female actors and ordering women news presenters to wear Islamic hijab, a term women's rights activists say is vague and could be interpreted conservatively. The rules drew criticism from international rights watchdog Human Rights Watch, which said media freedom was deteriorating in the country. Associate Asia director Patricia Gossman said the disappearance of any space for dissent and worsening restrictions for women in the media and arts is devastating. During the Taliban's previous rule, strict curbs were placed on women's ability to leave the house, unless accompanied by a male relative or to receive education. Apple said it has filed a lawsuit against the Israeli cyber firm NSO Group and its parent company OSY Technologies for alleged surveillance and targeting the U.S. Apple users with its Pegasus spyware. Apple is suing an Israeli cyber firm and its parent company for allegedly targeting its users with spyware. 
On Tuesday, the iPhone maker said it had filed a lawsuit against NSO Group and its parent company, OSY Technologies. The Israeli company's Pegasus software infects smartphones to enable the extraction of messages, photos and emails, record calls and secretly activate microphones. It's allegedly been used to target journalists, human rights activists and politicians. In its complaint, Apple said NSO's tools have been used in 2021 to, quote, target and attack Apple customers, and that US citizens have been surveilled by NSO's spyware on mobile devices that can and do cross international borders. Apple alleged that NSO Group created more than 100 fake Apple ID user credentials to carry out its attacks. It said that its servers were not hacked, but the NSO misused and manipulated them to deliver the attacks on Apple users. Apple is seeking to also ban NSO Group from using any Apple software, services or devices. NSO has always said its software is intended to be used by governments and law enforcement against criminals and terrorists. In a statement, it added that thousands of lives have been saved through the use of its tools. Apple plans to donate $10 million, as well as any damages recovered in the lawsuit, to cyber surveillance research groups. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The European Medicines Agency has started its marketing authorization review of Merck's COVID-19 antiviral pill, which could be completed within weeks. Italy's antitrust authoritarian has fined Amazon and Apple a combined 225 million US dollars for alleged anti-competitive cooperation for the sale of Apple and Beats products. The United States and Taiwan held a second meeting of their new annual economic dialogue aimed at forging closer ties. Held under increased pressure from China, the five-hour-long US-Taiwan Economic Prosperity Partnership Dialogue touched supply chain resilience, science and technology, digital economy and 5G. After winning big at the American Music Awards, BTS has been nominated for a Grammy, the top honor in popular music. Despite expectations, though they are not contending for any of the four main of the general fields, including Record of the Year. Britain's Prince Charles formally opened a new $1.3 billion AstraZeneca Research and Development Facility in Cambridge, England. He also viewed an exhibit on the pandemic and demonstration of how augmented reality headsets can help with lab work. NASA is preparing a mission to deliberately smash a spacecraft into an asteroid in a test run should humanity ever need to stop a giant space rock from wiping out life on Earth. Could this be planet Earth's future saviour? It's the stuff of movies, but NASA is pinning its hopes on this kind of technology, saving future generations from potential asteroid hits. Named DART, an acronym for Double Asteroid Redirection Test, the spacecraft will hurtle into Dimorphos, a tiny moon orbiting an asteroid called Didymos. Its mission, to nudge it off course by crashing into it at top speed. Scientists will then study how much the impact changes the object's trajectory by measuring how long the moon takes to orbit the asteroid after the hit. The aim is to find out if this kind of technology will be enough to redirect asteroids in the future. But for now, scientists insist Earth isn't under threat. NASA says it tracks more than 27,000 asteroids. So far, none of them are on a direct collision course with Earth. And finally tonight, Athens' annual Christmas tree lighting ceremony took place in the capital's main square with a spectacular light and music show. The 60,000 bulbs on the 19-meter-high fire tree in central Greece were lit amid smoke and rays of light from lamps placed on rooftops around Syntagma Square. The ceremony comes earlier than usual this year. The tree lighting usually takes place in December. The mayor of Athens said he wanted to lift people's spirits a little bit earlier as the country once again faces more COVID-19 restrictions and record high daily cases of the pandemic. There was no official ceremony in the square as in previous years before the pandemic so as not to draw large crowds of people. Another 350 lights have been strewn across the city for the holiday while squares in 35 neighbourhoods have also been decorated. 
In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.